Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2024. Yes, and welcome to the reading of lesson number two from the series on the book of John, written by E. Edward Zinke and Thomas R. Shepherd. Today's lesson is titled, Signs of Divinity, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 5. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these lessons coming from the book of John about the life of the lovely Jesus. Not just the lovely Jesus, but the Saviour Jesus. Not just the Saviour Jesus, but the Jesus who is one with you. And as we study the signs of divinity this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us. May your word speak to us in such a way that our confidence in you and our understanding of you will increase. Lord, wherever we are, wherever we're listening to the reading of this Sabbath school lesson, I pray that you will bless us, whether it's people who are listening through the services of Christian services for the blind and hearing impaired in Australia and New Zealand, whether it's those listening through Christian record services in the North American division, those who are viewing and listening on YouTube, and those who are listening on the Sabbath school app whether it be the official one at the uh, Sabbath School Department at the General Conference, iTunes, or any other app, Lord. As we listen, may your word speak to us. And today I'd particularly like to pray for Rawley Rowley in Tobago and Geraldine Seema of Port Millsby in Papua New Guinea. And Lord, it's so great that during the month of May, more than 300,000 people were baptised It was an amazing event, Lord, and we thank you for the working of your Holy Spirit. May we understand more about you and love you more today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is John chapter 11 and verse 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And to read the memory verse a second time is my own church pastor at the Landsborough Seventh-day Adventist Church, Pastor Ben R. Sam. Thank you, Pastor Ben. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? John eleven twenty five. The Bible is clear that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son, one with the Father, underived and uncreated. Jesus is the one who created all that was made, as you read in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Thus Jesus has always existed. There never was a time when he didn't exist. Though Jesus came to this world and took upon himself our humanity, he always kept his divinity. And at specific times Jesus said and did things that revealed this divinity. This truth was important for John, which is why, when recounting some of Jesus' miracles, John used them to point to Christ's divinity. Jesus not only said things that revealed his divinity, but backed up his words with works that manifested his divinity. This week's lesson looks at three of the greatest signs of Jesus' divinity. What is striking is that, in every case, Some people did not believe the miracle or perceive its significance. For some, it was a time of turning away from Jesus. For others, a time for deepening blindness. And for others, a time to plot Jesus' death. And for others, a time to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Sunday, October 6, the feeding of the 5,000. 
In John chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, which we'll read shortly, the Apostle goes out of his way to state that the timing of the feeding of the 5,000 was near the Passover. The Passover was a commemoration of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. The Passover lamb took the place of the death of the firstborn. This sacrifice symbolized the death of Jesus in our behalf. On the cross, the punishment that we deserved because of our sins fell on Jesus instead. Christ, our Passover, was indeed slayed for us, as we read in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7. Get rid of the old yeast, so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. We read in the Great Controversy, page 540, He bore the guilt of transgression and the hiding of his father's face, until his heart was broken and his life crushed out. All this sacrifice was made that sinners might be redeemed. End of quote. Read John chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. What parallels can be found here between Jesus and Moses? That is, what did Jesus do that should have reminded the people of the deliverance that their ancestors had received through the ministry of Moses. John 6, beginning at verse 1. Some time after this, Jesus crossed to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him, because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About five thousand men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Numerous details of this story place Jesus in parallel to Moses in the Exodus. The time of the Passover, we read in verse 4, points to the great deliverance from Egypt. Jesus goes up on a mountain in verse 3, as Moses went up on Sinai. Jesus tests Philip in verses 5 and 6, as the Israelites were tested in the wilderness. The multiplication of the loaves as we read in verse 11, is reminiscent of the manna. The gathering of the leftover food in verse 12 harks back to the Israelites gathering the manna. Twelve baskets of leftovers are picked up in verse 13, the same number as the twelve tribes of Israel. And the people comment that Jesus is the prophet coming into the world, in verse 14, parallel to the prophet like Moses, predicted in Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15, which reads, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. All of this points to Jesus as the new Moses, come to deliver his people. Thus, John is showing Jesus not only doing signs and wonders, but doing signs and wonders that, in their context, should have had special meaning for the Jewish people. 
Jesus was pointing them, in essence, to his own divinity. And so to finish the day, read Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6, and 1 Peter 1, 2 to 24. What great truth do these texts teach about Jesus as the Lamb of God? And how does his divinity tie into this truth? And why is this truth the most important truth we can ever know? Isaiah 53, beginning at verse 4. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Monday, October 7. Surely he is the prophet. Read John chapter 6, verses 14, 15, and 26 to 36. How did the people respond to his miracle, and how did Jesus use this to try to teach them who he was? First of all, John 6, beginning at verse 14. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. And then beginning in verse 26 of John chapter 6, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But, as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. The Judeans were expecting an earthly Messiah who would deliver them from the oppression of the Roman Empire. Two of the most difficult things encountered in war are feeding the troops and caring for the wounded and dead. By his miracles, Jesus showed that he could do both. But that's not why Jesus had come, and that wasn't the purpose of his miracle. Instead, the account of the feeding of the 5,000 provided the opportunity to illustrate that Jesus is the bread of life, that God himself came down from heaven. I am the bread of life, he said. He who comes to me shall never hunger, in John 6.35. This is the first of the seven I am statements in the Gospel of John, where I am is connected with some predicate. Bread of life, in John 6. 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. 
Light of the world, in John 8 verse 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then door in John 10, verses 7 and 9. Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. And verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. And good shepherd in John 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And then in John 11.25, the resurrection and the life. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And then in John 14, verse 6, we read about the way, the truth and the life. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And John 15, verse 1, the true vine. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. And then in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Each of these points to an important truth about Jesus. The I am statements point back to Exodus chapter 3, where God presents himself to Moses as the great I am. And here we're going to compare with John 8 verse 58. And that reads, Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus is that great I am. But the people missed all this. As we read in The Desire of Ages, page 385, their dissatisfied hearts queried why, if Jesus could perform so many wondrous works as they had witnessed, could he not give health, strength and riches to all his people, free them from their oppressors and exalt them to power and honour? The fact that he claimed to be the scent of God and yet refused to be Israel's king was a mystery which they could not fathom. His refusal was misinterpreted. Many concluded that he dared not assert his claims because he himself doubted as to the divine character of his mission. Thus they opened their hearts to unbelief, and the seed which Satan had sown bore fruit of its kind in misunderstanding and defection. End of quote. They were looking for material benefit instead of truth that endures to eternal life. This is a trap that we all potentially face if we are not careful. And so to finish today, how can we avoid getting caught up in material things at the expense of the spiritual? Tuesday, October 8. The Healing of the Blind Man, Part 1 Read John chapter 9, verses 1 to 16. What did the disciples think was the cause of this man's blindness? And how did Jesus correct their false beliefs? John 9, beginning at verse 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, 
Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they call Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others answered, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. The disciples made a connection between sickness and sin. A number of Old Testament passages point in that direction. And just let's have a look at them. Exodus 20 verse 5. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And Second Kings chapter 5, verses 15 to 27. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also, when I bow down in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord forgive your servants for this. Go in peace, Elisha said. After Naaman had travelled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman. This Aramean by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? he asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, Two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them, and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants, and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away and they left. When he went in and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes or olive groves and vineyards or flocks and herds or male and female slaves? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous and he had become as white as snow. And Second Kings chapter 15 verse 5. The Lord afflicted the king with leprosy until the day he died, and he lived in a separate house. Jotham, the king's son, had charge of the palace and governed the people of the land. 
And then 2 Chronicles 26, verses 16 to 21. But after Isaiah became powerful, his pride fell to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Azariah the priest, with eighty other courageous priests of the Lord, followed him in. They confronted King Uzziah and said, It is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful, and you will not be honoured by the Lord God. Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand ready to burn incense, became angry. While he was raging at the priests in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. When Azariah, the chief priest, and all the other priests looked at him, they saw that he had leprosy on his forehead. So they hurried him out. Indeed, he himself was eager to leave, because the Lord had afflicted him. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous and banned from the temple of the Lord. Jotham his son had charge of the palace and governed the people of the land. But the story of Job should have led to caution about whether such a connection always occurred. Jesus sets the matter straight, not denying any connection between sin and suffering but, in this case, pointing to a higher purpose, that God would be glorified by the healing. The account contains certain affinities to the creation story, that of God's transforming the first man from the dust of the ground, as recorded in Genesis 2 verse 7, just as Jesus makes clay to provide the blind man what was missing from the womb. In Matthew, Mark and Luke, Miracle stories follow a common pattern, an expression of the problem, the bringing of the individual to Jesus, the cure, and recognition of the cure with praise to God. In the story in John chapter 9, this sequence is completed in John 9 verse 7. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. But typical of John, the significance of the miracle becomes the much wider point of discussion, leading to a long interaction between the healed man and the religious leaders. This striking discussion revolves around two intertwined contrasting pairs of concepts. Sin versus works of God and blindness versus sight. The narrator does not tell the reader until John 9.14 that Jesus did this healing on the Sabbath, which, according to tradition and not scripture, violated the Sabbath. And thus, he was counted as a Sabbath breaker by the Pharisees. We read in John 9.14, Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Their conclusion was that He was not from God because they maintained that he does not keep the Sabbath. But others found it troubling that a sinner could do such signs in verse 16. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. The discussion is far from over but already a division appears. The blind man is becoming more and more clear about who Jesus is, but the religious leaders are becoming more and more confused or blind as to his real identity. And so to finish the day, what should this story tell us about the dangers of being so blinded by our own beliefs and traditions that we can miss important truths right before our own eyes? Wednesday, October 9, The Healing of the Blind Man, Part 2 Read John, Chapter 9, Verses 17 to 34 What questions did the leaders ask, and how did the blind man respond? 
John chapter 9, beginning at verse 17. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us! And... They threw him out. This long section of John chapter 9 is the only portion of John where Jesus is not the main actor on the stage, though he is certainly the subject of discussion. Just as the question of sin started the story in verse 2, the Pharisees think Jesus is a sinner because he healed on the Sabbath, as we read in verse 24 and earlier in verse 16. And they will slander the healed man as born in utter sin in verse 34. A curious reversal occurs. The blind man comes to see more and more, not just physically, but spiritually, as he is growing in his appreciation for Jesus and believing more strongly in him. The Pharisees, in contrast, become more and more blind in their understanding, first being divided over Jesus, as we read in verse 16, and then not knowing where he came from in verse 29. Meanwhile, his recounting of this miracle gives John the opportunity to tell us who Jesus is. The theme of signs in John 9 intersects with several other themes in the Gospel. John affirms that Jesus is the light of the world in John 9 verse 5. And we're going to compare this with John 8 verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The story also deals with Jesus' mysterious origin. Who is he? Where is he from? What is his mission? As we read in verses 12 and 29, and we'll compare that with John 1 verse 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The figure of Moses, who is referenced in 
previous miracle accounts also appears in this chapter, and we read that in verses 28 and 29. We compare this with John chapter 5, verses 45 and 46. But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. And John 6, verse 32, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. Finally, there is the theme of the response of the crowd. Some love darkness rather than light, while others respond in faith in verses 16 to 18 and in verses 35 to 41. And that reads, beginning at verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he had found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? the man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. And we'll compare this with John chapter 1, verses 9 to 16. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God children born not of natural descent, not of natural decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. And then John chapter 3, verses 16 to 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. And John chapter 6, verses 60 to 71. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time many of the disciples turned back and no longer followed him. 
You do not want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve, yet one of you is a devil? He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. So scary here is the spiritual blindness of the religious leaders. A once blind beggar can declare, Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. That was verses 32 and 33 from chapter 9. And yet, the religious leaders, the spiritual guides of the nation, the ones who should have been the first to recognize Jesus and accept him as the Messiah, they, despite all the powerful evidence, cannot see it. Or they don't really want to see it. What a powerful warning about how our hearts can deceive us. And so to finish today, read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 29. How does what Paul writes in these verses fit with John's account above, and how does the same principle apply even now? 1 Corinthians 1, beginning at verse 26. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. Thursday, October 10, The Resurrection of Lazarus John chapter 11 is filled with sadness. The sad news of a dear friend's illness we read in Chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Then there's the weeping over his death. In verses 19... And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And verse 31, when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. And in verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her were also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. The sisters lament that Lazarus would not have died if Jesus had been present. We read about in verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And also in verse 32, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus' own tears in verse 35. Jesus wept. But Jesus had delayed two days before starting his journey to Lazarus, even indicating that he was glad that he had not gone earlier in verses 14 and 15. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. This action was not from any cold-heartedness. Rather, it was to reveal God's glory. By the time we get to John eleven seventeen to 27 Lazarus had been dead four days. John 11, beginning at verse 17, On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. 
Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is come into the world. Lazarus had been dead four days. After four days, his body would already be rotting. And as Martha said, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days, in verse 39. No doubt, Jesus' delay only helped make the miracle that followed even more astonishing, to raise a rotting corpse. What more proof could Jesus have given that indeed he was God himself? And as God, as the one who had created life to begin with, Jesus had power over death. Thus, Jesus uses this opportunity, that of Lazarus's death, to reveal a crucial truth about himself. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. That's John eleven twenty five to 26. Read John 11, verses 38 to 44. What did Jesus do that supported his claim? John 11, beginning at verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Just as Jesus showed he is the light of the world in John 8.12 and John 9.5 by giving the blind man sight in John 9 verse 7, so here he raises Lazarus from the dead, as we've just read in verses 43 and 44 of chapter 11, demonstrating that he is the resurrection and the life, as he claimed in chapter 11 verse 25. This miracle more than any other, points to Jesus as the life-giver, as God himself. It provides strong support for John's theme that Jesus is the divine Son of God, and that, by believing, we can have life through him, as we read in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. However, by the time we get to the end of this incredible story in John eleven forty-five to 54 in which 
many who saw believed, as we saw in verse 45, a powerful but sad irony unfolds. Let's read those verses in John chapter 11, verses 45 to 54. Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on they plotted to take his life. Therefore Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. Jesus shows that he can bring the dead back to life, and yet these men think that they can stop him by killing him. What an example of the foibles of humanity in contrast to the wisdom and power of God. Friday, October 11, Further Thought From the book The Desire of Ages, page 390, we read, The life of Christ that gives life to the world is in his word. It was by his word that Jesus healed disease and cast out demons. By his word he stilled the sea and raised the dead. And the people bore witness that his word was with power. He spoke the word of God as he had spoken through all the prophets and teachers of the Old Testament. The whole Bible is a manifestation of Christ and the Saviour desired to fix the faith of his followers on the word. When his visible presence should be withdrawn, the word must be their source of power. Like their master, they were to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4.4. As our physical life is sustained by food, so our spiritual life is sustained by the word of God, and every soul is to receive life from God's word for himself. As we must eat for ourselves in order to receive nourishment, so we must receive the word for ourselves. We are not to obtain it merely through the medium of another's mind. We should carefully study the Bible, asking God for the aid of the Holy Spirit that we may understand his word. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, this week we looked at Jesus feeding the 5,000, healing a man blind from birth, and then raising Lazarus from the dead. In each case, Jesus provided powerful evidence for his divinity. Yet these miracles, as amazing as they were, created division. Some responded with faith, others with doubt. What does this teach us about how, even in the face of powerful evidence, people can still choose to reject God? Question 2. These stories all point toward Christ as the divine Son of God. Why is his divinity so important to faith in Jesus as the Saviour? And 3. Look again at 1 Corinthians 1, 26-29. In what ways in the 21st century do we see this same principle at work? What are some of the foolish things that Christians believe, things that the wise according to the flesh mock and reject? What do we believe that also put to shame the things that are mighty? Let's read 1 Corinthians 1, 26-29. Brothers and sisters, 
Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. And reading our inside story, our mission story for this week is Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Revival in Rural Columbia by Andrew McChesney. Pablo had never heard of Seventh-day Adventists, a leader among the Sequani indigenous people in Colombia. He was far from home when he was invited to a Sabbath school worship service. This Saturday we will have a meeting, someone said. Come. Pablo went to the morning service and saw that people studied the Bible. He returned for the afternoon service and heard people asking Bible questions. He was amazed that Christian Camilo, the 25-year-old missionary who had led the morning service, answered every question from the Bible. When he got a chance, Pablo had his own question. What do I need to do to become a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? he asked. We can start Bible studies, Christian said. He gave Pablo a set of 20 Bible lessons in Pablo's own native Sequani language. Pablo was pleased and asked for lessons for the rest of his family. Christian gave Pablo a Bible and promised to travel to his community with lessons for his family. Christian was responsible for a large territory and three months passed before he was able to visit Pablo. He travelled with two Sequani Adventists because he couldn't find Pablo's rural community without their help. Pablo welcomed Christian and announced that he had finished studying the 20 Bible lessons. He said he also had given Bible studies to his family and the rest of the community, and 15 people were ready to be baptised. Christian, who had arrived on a Friday, spent the rest of the day answering Bible questions and checking whether the people were ready for baptism. When the sun set, he led an evening worship program. On Sabbath morning, Christian led the community in a divine worship service. Afterward, one man said, There's a lake over there. Another said, We want to be baptised right now. That Sabbath, five people were baptised. Pablo, his mother, his two brothers and a sister-in-law. Today, Pablo is giving Bible studies to his people. There are many people who are hungry for the word of God in Pablo's community, Christian said. Like Pablo, there are many people who are waiting to be reached. Thank you for your prayers for missionaries who, like Christian, face huge challenges reaching unreached people groups in Colombia and elsewhere around the world. Learn about Adventist Missions work to reach unreached people groups at bit.ly slash gm pioneers gmp are capitals these lessons are provided by the general conference office at adventist mission which uses sabbath school mission offerings to spread the gospel worldwide read new stories daily at adventistmission.org <laughs> 